Vista is, we're now recording, excellent. So the UNCO2 launch. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna share my screen uh, and the website I'm putting in the chat, the, our, the actual UNCO2 website. Uh, and so I am going to walk through uh, the site and if I can find it in the sharing. Ah, here it is. Um, uh, so that you can see what we're talking about when we go to everything. And actually, I'm just going to back this up a little bit so you can see uh, the actual uh, site. So this is what you see when you, you come to the website. And, and everything that we do is centered on this site. So we use this site for everything, including posting research about the project, um, describing the project, et cetera. So you've gotten about the project, our workshops, and the teacher's pack, the teacher's resources are here under games and resources. Uh, and that's what we're gonna walk through today. Uh, so this is, as you can see, a resource map for running UNCO2 with your students. And this works for uh, in-classroom, online teaching, as well as homeschooling. So it's pretty broad and it can be adapted to, to a lot of different uh, activities and uh, situations. Um, so we've given you the link here to the, the teacher's pack, as we call it, which is um, a bunch of documents that we've given you, including lesson plans, uh, worksheets, uh, overview of, of things you may be interested in, in terms of, of background and context, that sort of thing. So when you click that, where that actually takes you is here to a form uh, that just collects a little bit of information so that we know who is using it. Uh, you'll see that your name and email are optional, but we would love if you feel filled in at least your email um, so that we can update you on the project. And we kind of, you know, if we, we have any questions, we can kind of reach out sometimes. And then you'll see, we just kind of get, get an idea of, of where you are, uh, who you're using it with, and how you heard about it. So this is just for our purposes. It's not for anything else other than for us to understand um, the reach of the project. And once you're done with that, it gives you a link to uh, the Dropbox file. Uh, of all the materials. And we've got some old material, which uh, was basically uh, restricted to classroom use. So when we originally developed this, obviously it was pre-pandemic and we because conducted all the workshops in person in classrooms. Uh, in uh, late, early last year, we very hurriedly, as many, many people did, uh, revised it so that you can use it online. And so what we've got here are uh, some descriptions of the program, some links, online lessons plans for each workshop, and then documentations, uh, including uh, worksheets and task sheets uh, that I will, I, can, I will happily share as uh, Jennifer walks through workshop one. So that's, again, that link is here or here, and it takes you to the uh, Google form and then the Dropbox with all the documents. So I am going to uh, turn over now to Jennifer, who's going to talk about workshop one. Cool. Okay. So um, the idea of the project was to combine the kind of experience and the expertise of, of the academics that we had on board. So um, I was very interested in, in teaching some chemistry through the program. Um, and I was really interested in incorporating some um, creative writing, digital fiction. And um, so we wanted students to understand not only kind of the mechanics of climate change, but also the social implications um, and, and make the, the program relevant to, to their lives. Um, so Lyle, do you want to go to the workshop one worksheet? Do you want me to share screen? Uh, let me find. I've okay, I've got it up if you want. Nope, I've I've got it. Okay. I just couldn't see it again. <laughs> uh, hold on. It's, you there can we do go. It. it was hiding my tab. Uh, so yeah. which is okay? The task? So if you bring up the task sheet first. So um, with the task sheet. 
Um, we wanted, so this is written for, for a home learning. So um, we wanted the students to understand what the definition of a carbon footprint was, because this is something that's being used a lot more in, in the media um, and in general conversation. Um, and then to understand where um, carbon dioxide comes from. Um, and so for the online version, we've made a video um, which shows that the molecules break apart um, and then we get them to write in the equation so that they understand that you've got to burn uh, methane as a fossil fuel in oxygen to create carbon dioxide and water. Um, and if we were going to do this in the classroom, then we would get, um, oh yeah, of course we should have started that. Good question, Bill. Uh, so this was designed um, for year nine pupils, so ages um, 13 and 14 in the UK um, school system. Um, but we have trialled it with year eight and year 10. So it, it does um, ages 12 to 15. Um, in the classroom, it's really nice to do a bit of chemical modelling. So if you've got something like Molly Mod or even some Lego, you could have you know, a black block for your carbon and then white blocks for your hydrogen and red blocks for your oxygen, then you can break them all apart um, and, and put them back together. Um, but then to make it relevant to the students, so Lyle, if you scroll down, we wanted them to think about um, what they do in their lives. And so what do you eat for breakfast? How do you get to school? Um, and what's your journey length? Um, and then we wanted to them to compare that to uh, what they were doing under pandemic conditions because you've probably changed your breakfast you've probably changed your commute because you're probably not commuting anymore um, and that will all decrease the carbon footprint and so to help them out calculating that so Lyle if you go to the uh, reference document which is on the yeah is it this one yeah brilliant um so we have calculated and these are, um, all these values are true for, um, they're as up to date as last year. Um, and so uh, we talk a lot in the, the media and, and in kind of climate change conversations about tons of carbon dioxide or kilograms of carbon dioxide. And it's really hard to get an idea of, of what that looks like. Um, and so we've converted everything into balloons. So one balloon holds nine grams or 16 liters of carbon dioxide. Um, and so you can see if you have some sort of chocolate cereal with cow's milk, uh, which my son did, uh, then his carbon footprint is about 58 balloons. Uh, whereas I chose the non-dairy option, um, but still had chocolate cereal. So my, um, my carbon footprint was only 30 balloons for my breakfast this morning, although I did have half an apple, so I'm at 32 and a half. Um, and then Lyle, if you scroll down, uh, so then you can see, you know, you might have had a shower, um, you might have dried your hair afterwards, you may have watched TV, um, you may have had a, you know, I had a cup of tea to go with my uh, my um, breakfast, so that's adding me up a few more balloons because my son had water. Um, I think we're about equal for breakfast now. Uh, and then you can see the travel as well. And so, <laughs> you know, um, with, with the students, they can calculate their carbon footprint for um, before uh lockdown so in normal times and then in lockdown which is afterwards and see what the drop is in their carbon footprint but in class what you can do is you can do this then as a group activity where kids calculate their individual carbon footprints uh, and then you can say okay we'll get into a group of three or four and drop your your group's carbon footprint by a third um and so then they can look and have a negotiation and, and think about you know like maybe so-and-so would get to school in a different way, um, but they would keep their breakfast. And maybe the trade-off would be, you know, so-and-so would keep their breakfast, but they'd maybe walk to school because they realized that they didn't need the car to get a mile to school. Um, and, you know, it gets them into that idea of, this is real, it's relevant to my life, um, and, uh, and I can make a difference. So this is the first stage where we're kind of empowering them to think about how they can effect change. Um, so that then brings them into to workshop two. Okay. Yeah, I'm just uh, getting back to workshop two. Okay, workshop two. There we go, revised. Um, so workshop two is very centered around um, the actual interactive digital fiction that 
uh, we created specifically for this project. Uh, and so I'm going to show this to you. This is uh, basically an interactive story. And I'll click play now. Uh, oh, it doesn't like me. Um, <laughs> You I have to register your own code now. Yeah. Um, there we go. Okay, now we can log in. I set these all up, you would think I would have my own ID. Um, so this is an interactive story. Um, we call them interactive digital narratives. And uh, it, it, it walks students through the narrative, but they get to interact with it. They get to do certain things. And on this screen, you can see um, you're getting a new, essentially uh, in the story, it's called a calm ID, but it's basically they're getting a new mobile phone uh, because they, they, they broke it or they lost it. Uh, so um, they have to reset it up with uh, their name and their friend's name. So this is a way of getting their some personalization into the story. So they enter in their names. Um, and so if I were doing this, and I'd, I'd put my friend's names in and make sure that I give them their pronouns and we'll let Paul join us. Uh, and so, yes, these are correct. And so you go on and this is something that Helen is gonna be talking about here in a second. Uh, we do have um, uh, some accessibility guides and actually you'll see that I don't have sound turned on the screen sharing right now. So you're not hearing this, uh, but when you roll over, when you're on a laptop, if you roll over with the mouse, it gives you a, uh, a pronunciation of the word as well as gives you an alternative definition in the switchover. Uh, so that uh, if there are difficult words, you have an alternative uh, and you can hear it as well to, to help uh, different levels of learners. Uh, and then there are different kinds of links that we can take. Uh, and so we start the story. Uh, so the story is told through animations and text and links. It's very image light uh, because we want this to be accessible on lots of different um, devices and uh, situations. So a lot of schools don't have very good connectivity, that sort of thing. So we keep it mostly to text and lots of different uh, links. Um, so the, the blue link is a special kind of link called a cycling link. This is where they can make choices. Uh, so this is a choice about what transportation they're going to take. Uh, so of where they're going. So they've got different levels of transportation. You can see there are uh, parallels to private transportation, public transportation, or, or walking. Um, and you, they walk through this story that you can see they make different choices throughout. Um, they have different pop-ups that, that bring them into the story world. So on its, at its basic level, what I wanted when um, this story, when I designed the story was I wanted kids to like it. I wanted it to work for them just as a narrative or a game. Uh, because I want them to connect to it. I want them to be excited about it, to want to finish it. Um, there are a total of, I think, uh, six different major endings with 18 different permutations of those endings. Um, so I wanted them to, when they got to the end, to go, oh, I could make different choices and see what else happens. And then they go back to the beginning and uh, start again and make different choices. Um, and so that they could, <clears throat> they can see uh, how their actions and how their choices change the story world. Uh, the reason that it is, um, I'm going to stop sharing there for just a second, otherwise I get distracted by the story. Um, and so- I was distracted but, by all the different words that you've added into it yeah. as your thesaurus, it's amazing. Um, so the the idea for workshop two is that depending on your classroom, 
Uh, and and we've sort of leaving it up to the teachers to decide this because the feedback that we got from the pilot was some teachers really liked a group reading where we sort of sit together as a class and all work through one playthrough of the text and then discuss it in workshop two. For other classrooms, that was just chaos and and left some students out and and didn't work at all. And those teachers wanted it to be more one on one. The students uh, would read through it. In in uh, pairs or in small groups or individually. That can depend on uh, devices they have access to. If, if there's one device per student, it can depend on the student's level. It can depend on lots of things. So that's a choice we, we like to leave it up. But anyway, it's basically a reading uh, element that they read through the story. And the nice, the, the thing about it that we was research-based. Uh, we put in things that were relevant to their level things that appeal to that age level in stories, um, decisions that they are capable of making at their age. So they aren't capable of making the decision about where they live. That's their parents, you know, or where they go to school, those sorts of things. But they are capable of saying, I don't want to eat chocolate cereal with cow's milk in the morning. Can we please get uh, some in-season fruit, local fruit for me to eat in the morning. They are capable of maybe making some of those choices, but influencing or saying, mom, you don't have to drive me all the way to school. You can drive me to a drop off point and I'll walk with my friends. Things like that are, are things that they are capable of pushing back on. Um, and also we narrowed in the story world. One of the things about climate change is that we share the responsibility for it with 7 billion other people. And that's a big diffusion of responsibility. So in the story, the world is contracted. They're on a moon colony with only about 300 people. And so their decisions are much more amplified and they can actually see the results of them. And it helps them to feel like they have agency in the world and that they're, they, what they do does matter. And then there's levels of, of hope. You know, if you do take action, things will get better. And so we wanted to infuse the, the story with that and have them be able to discuss that. Workshop three, and I will... <coughs> oh, sorry, Lyle, do you want to... We, yeah, do you want a coughing break and I'll talk about... Um, so we've got a worksheet um, to support oh, yeah. the reading through of the, um, of the story, and that's differentiated as well. Uh, so Helen will talk a bit more about that. So we've put some scaffolding in um tasks to complete and they can tick the box when they've done it so found the unco2 website named the characters played the story to the end um found a disastrous ending found a hopeful ending found three endings found six endings um so they can kind of tick as they as they go through um and then you could you know remove a few objectives if you knew that you were going to have students who who might not get that far in a lesson um and then we've got questions for them to react uh, for them to kind of reflect on the story so um in the canteen scene you had a number of options um which did you choose and why and then for the less able students we scaffold it by saying uh, for example i chose to join in with this because it sounded like a fun thing to do um uh and then they get asked, can you describe with examples what low carbon choices you've made in the story what high carbon choices you made um and then starting to think about um, the characters and how that changed the outcome. So name the characters you approached to change the outcome of the story and what was the outcome. Um, what do your experiences in the story and your answers to the questions above suggest about changes you could make in your own life? So it kind of, it takes it through. Um, and uh, thanks for joining us, Ben. Um, you know, it gives them the opportunity to, to think through Ah, you found it. Well done. Um, yeah, how is this relevant to my life? Um, but we, <laughs> I, th I think that reflecting on it now, a year on, the, did anyone die as a result of your choices is possibly not the best question to have in there anymore. Um, sorry about that. Um, yeah, but we were very conscious that, you know, teaching climate change can sometimes be seen as really daunting because you don't want a whole group of students to suddenly feel like, oh my gosh, the planet's ending and you know, doom. Um, and we're very conscious that, you know, it, we want to create that sense of hope, we want to create that sense of empowerment. Um, and, and so having the story in the way that it is means that they can dip into it without really emotionally connecting it to climate change if they don't want to. Um, but these these questions do sort of start to encourage them to, to try and 
think through that. Uh, so you can okay. see the um, the worksheet continues for workshop three. So yeah. Lyle, do you want to take back over? So I'm gonna yeah. So workshop three is um, kind of my my favorite part, and this is where we ask them ask the students to use the same a uh, program that I did in order to create No World for Tomorrow, and they create their own stories. So again, very research based here in that we based the workshop series on uh, multi-literacies, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, um, the new curriculum for Wales, uh, however you want to frame it. And we do have uh, links to the papers and things where we talk about this. Um, but the idea was to combine a lot of different areas of teaching and learning in one workshop series so that they're doing science, they're doing reading, they're doing writing, they're getting some digital literacy um, and doing some, some digital programming or writing. So the program that we use for this is called Twine and it's uh, it's pretty straightforward. I'll, I'll show you actually the, the tutorial um, because it has images and things like that that show what it is. This tutorial itself was written in the program. Uh, and so the, and the nice thing about it is it's a very good teaching tool in that it can be downloaded and opened and you can see how each twine piece was made. Uh, so you can always see sort of behind the curtain of all these programs. So uh, we asked the students to walk through uh, this tutorial doing some basics, um, including starting from basics and this is what you know, talking about this is what the Twine home screen looks like. Um, this is how you get a start. Uh, this is what the interface looks like. And these are the things that you have to do. So the basics are, don't worry about that part. We don't actually do that anymore. Um, but the basics are just clicking on a passage, entering in text. Um, some versions of Twine, you will have this sort of helper text here that gives some information about how to do things in Twine. Really, the only thing that the students need to know, and we walk them through this that in this tutorial, is this element right here that says to link to another passage, write the link text and passage name like this, which is in square brackets. And that's the only thing they have to do. That's the bare minimum and that they do to uh, create a story. So they enter in some text, have a, a title and they can enter in as much text as they like, and then they link them together. Uh, and so you can see there's those square brackets in the passage uh, and that's what creates a link to a new passage. And then it will look like this and these will have links that they can click to go to a new passage. So basically they're creating a website, but they're creating a website that's a story. And what we have told them is, that it's the only thing we want is that it be related to climate change. They can do all kinds of different things uh, related to their story or related to climate change, related to their life, related to uh, what they are interested in, what they do on a daily basis, what their hobbies are, what their family life is like. Um, and so you can see that there are uh, a number of different approaches that the students take to this. And we do try to put up student games as we collect them uh, so that you, so that the students can see uh, what other students have done and things that they have um, considered. Uh, this one I think is one of Jennifer's favorite. Yeah, it's one of my they, favorites. Um, now remember that these aren't, these were just done in one hour. So the students didn't have a chance to do them uh, from this particular workshop series. They didn't have a chance to go back and, and fix them. They, they were a bit rushed, but this is them getting the basics of Twine and making a story in one hour. So she wakes up, um, she's got some hard decisions, which Mission number one is apparently she's got to get ready. And the, the big question is whether she wears makeup or not. Um, so now you've got to start off thinking about where the makeup comes from. Uh, and so she had to do a little bit of research here uh, in that to figure out, okay, you have to get there. Um, so you can see elements of workshop one appearing here where she's doing some math and figuring out what the carbon footprint is of that travel. Uh, thinking she had to do some research to figure out, okay, where does 
some of the minerals that go into makeup. Where does it come from? What does it mean? Um, thinking about origins of things. And so there's, uh, and then we sort of, you know, well, we get a bit mean. Um, you can see there are, there's very much the choose your own adventure aspect of like, oh no, you died, start again um, to some of these things. But it's very interesting to see some of the choices that they make um, in these stories. The other thing that we provide, if I go back to uh, the I, I really like the social, um, and like the ethical kind of part of that story, because it starts off with, you're a girl, you've got to make difficult decisions, do you wear makeup? And you think it's going to be really kind of floopy and, and lightheaded. And then actually, what comes into it is, you know, first, you're going to go and mine for the components of your makeup, but also that idea that you know, the makeup's going to retail at this price, but actually you're going to get paid this price. Um, and do you still want the job? And so there's that sense of, you know, ethics and, and social responsibility and, and an understanding that actually people are paid really poorly for products that gain companies quite a lot of profit. Yep, absolutely. So one of the biggest stumbling blocks that we had in doing our pilot workshops uh, was that we would, if if the students hadn't done some elements of this as homework, like they'd gone home from workshop two and thought about what kind of story they would build and mapped it out a little bit, they often sat down at the computer and had writers talk. Um, and the question we had the most was, how do I know what to write? What do I write? I don't know what to write. So we built uh, a little, Jennifer and I did, we built a little story prompt out of Twine again that asked, did they do the homework? And this links them to uh, what the, the homework was or what the exercise was uh, sort of between workshop two and three that we recommended was given as homework, but we couldn't control that. Uh, and they can say, uh, no, uh, I didn't do it. And now I here I'm having to, to start the story and, and I don't know what to do. Um, so uh, they can choose to walk through the homework assignment um and and this is the bear this is like the most help they can possibly get so what world would they like to set their story in we found that a lot of people uh mimicked no world for tomorrow and set it on the moon um and we give little hint tips uh marked by this uh little bright uh light bulb um where we try to give them an idea of what they can do um so let's say we set it on the desert uh, and they get to choose their narrative perspective or point of view. Um, so that's quite common. Uh, it's let's make it about me, the story. And they can always just go, oh, I know what I want to do and, and skip over all of this. Um, the story is about me. So I enter my name and my pronoun, which is familiar from playing the, the game in workshop two. Let's set the story in the future um uh what other characters so that again we're entering in different people's names so that we can are generating some things so uh, uh so just a reminder that you chose second person point of view So they, these are themes that they've already picked upon in the, in the uh, sessions. And so they, they quite often will, 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 will jump into that. Um, and you can see, we, we even give some, some prompts that you can see are already uh, customized by the input that we've had. So the name is there and the, the uh, setting is there. Uh, and they write a couple of things. You go get some eggs from the chickens. And instead of, so you can see where we're starting a branching option here. Um, so we've got elements of the story. This is what we've got. Um, 
it's in second person point of view it's at the desert it's about me and jennifer and helen and we wake up and think about what we want for breakfast get eggs or cereal yep i want to create my story um we jump into the twine tutorial and say okay you're gonna open your own twine game and get to this point and then you have the passage the very first passage of your story that gets copied and then you go to twine which i will open quickly here to show you how it works and so we've opened this passage we name the passage and you can see that it's i've just full on pasted in there and boom we've already got um a story started they've already got three passages so now you go and get some eggs from the chickens you know they had three eggs great you can just start going from there and so um we're hoping that this sort of prompt that that really does walk them and there's uh, a couple of different ways it walks them through uh including um asking them about uh things that they're interested in things that they like uh if they like football where does a football come from do teams have to travel to play games that has some carbon footprint so there's different ways to work through that so in and of itself that prompt is a is a branching narrative and then uh once they have gone through workshop three or they're doing workshop three they can ooh, that's the wrong link. We need to fix that. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, so the things that they've done, they've get one link passage, uh, five, wrote a complete story, been able to save it, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, they get an idea of what's a good thing to have done as, as part of this and, and what are we looking for? So this is also something that uh, they, you can use for uh, peer to peer review, peer to peer discussion. Uh, you can use it as a rubric uh, to mark their work if you're going down that route. Uh, so there's lots of different options. Uh, we uh, in collecting, you can see we have a submit student games. Um, so we have uh, done some qualitative analysis analysis of student games to see how well they're taking on the the actual lessons in these workshops and i'm going to let uh helen talk about that here in a second um so yeah so that's workshops two and three um jennifer do you have anything that you want to add that i might have missed out on there in workshops two? no and three? i think i think you did an awesome job i'm just conscious of time because we've been mm -hmm. talking about 35 minutes now um and i'd love uh to give Yep. Helen, five minutes because you know Great. she's a teacher and she really knows stuff exactly. um as opposed to us who pretend um and then i promise we'll open up the floor for questions grand ellen over to you hello um so i suppose I'm, i've come wearing two hats to this project and i'm very very lucky to sit on fences and have feet in two camps for much of my professional life and um, i'll kind of address what we've done to differentiate and help help you gin and tonic kids and help your your kids who find things trickier as well your gnt so sort of the more able and those that find things tricky very often what you do for kids with literacy difficulties particularly is good for other learners i'm sure if you're in the classroom if you've ever done that you, it, use we use non-serif fonts which is just such a little tiny baby adjustment that just makes everything so much easier to read um, one of the things that we did, and we spent quite a lot of time, didn't we, Lyle, talking about the language and having these definitions, because if you can't, it, if, even if you can chunk, chunk down the word, if you don't know what it means, it, it just becomes a massive barrier. Um, and again, because it's, <clears throat> if you're working particularly remotely, it can seem like a, a huge monolithic task to go write your own twine thing. So having these little chunk down, chunk down um, worksheets so that the kids know what they need to do one at a time is brilliant for kids to feel successful. And some of the kids, we've got some kids on board, haven't we, Jennifer, that are home uh, from a PRU, I believe. I can't remember the exact sort of detail of it, but that have... Oh, what? Sorry? 
a referral that have a complicated sort of oh yes yeah well, um yeah once schools go back after easter yes we're hoping that some students who've been kind of sent out of, of they're normal. not in mainstream for various yeah, thank you. reasons so people who have a very <clears throat> we've kind of come up this with the with the brains that kids who've got a complicated relationship with school can access it for whatever reason some kids it could be emotional thing, a gazillion reasons but school is not an easy place for them but also for kids who want to learn but just find it difficult and I think what's quite nice is because I am dyslexic as well as being I've been a Senko in my or an Alco I think you call it in Wales so I've, I've dealt with kids with special needs and been in charge of their provision um it's quite nice that I am also dyslexic because I get sweary when computers don't do what I want them to do twine has not done that to me twine is brilliant because it's so visual the I I think it's brilliant it's so accessible so the whole project being set up to run on something that is within this sort of workspace that's flowcharts is absolutely brilliant um so kind of the accessing the website we spent time going through it it's all readable I've played it I spent time yesterday just checking that even if you've just got the um, read aloud function in Microsoft Edge, it works. I've got an add-on on Google Chrome, it works, it reads. And little things like that are gold dust for children who find literacy a barrier or for kids who sometimes just like to listen. Um, so it's a really nice visual, um, accessible, you don't need to spend hours on it. And walking through that tutorial is brilliant as well, what you've just taken us through Lyle, because TAs can't go to every child's house. We, we've had that difficulty. We really have had that difficulty at school these last two weeks with no year sevens and eights. Um, so it's such a powerful thing. So that's kind of, we've spent a lot of time making it accessible for kids, but also it's very, because it's accessible, it's very easy for kids to then self-differentiate. So if you've got your more able kids who have got these amazing ideas that are complex and branchy and exciting, they can just do it and not have to worry about the, the technicality of it so I think it's a fantastic medium and I'm, I'm oh, it's really really brilliant and Lyle's done all the work and it's amazing that's my sort of teacher hat that's what I do in that respect and I also I, I do I do kind of quality I know I don't do kind of I do qualitative analysis of yes own it because you're brilliant <laughs> I'm supported by wonderful ladies um, I've just been writing down what we did as well um so we came up with a model that kind of uh, we've got like a sample space that's kind of a 3d sample space if I could have drawn it I would but I couldn't um not on the computer anyway and so we're kind of looking at where within this model space kids sit because we're aiming for them to all have the capacity to engage on a personal level or to see what they can do but also to then kind of take the governmental ball by the horns and go do stuff and be able to engage with wider institutions and understand how to so we've kind of the 3d sample space that we've got is so that we can kind of look at where different kids responses sit within that space so that we can see how much agency they perceive they have and then as teachers we can then get oh that kid needs a little bit of an edge in this direction or oh this kid needs an edge in that direction and it's just a kind of tool to know where your class where members of your class are so you know how to adapt things for the next stage and we're talking about next stage but kind of the, the stage where your kids take this learning out of the classroom internalize it and then kind of do stuff with it but practical tan tangible real world stuff and that's kind of our next thought process it was the chat ye yesterday so yeah that's sort of what I bring to the to the party I'll stop talking now <laughs>